All right, folks. He is one of the most legendary horror actors of our time. He's been in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. He was the star of The Hills Have Eyes. He has appeared in Weird Science. He's been in The Devil's Rejects, and he's about to star in Rob Zombie's new film, The Lords of Salem. Hey, he's also been on ALF, Max. Can you believe that? I'm shitting my pants right now. <laughs> <laughs> he's Michael Berryman. Michael, how you doing, my man? Woo! I'm doing great. California sends a big shout-out to New York. It's not Awesome. Just- yeah, it's a beautiful state. There's actually hey. trees there. Yes. Yes. Welcome, Michael. It's, a, it's an honor and a pleasure to have you aboard here. Well, you're so kind, I, but I'll, I'll say thank you. <laughs> Michael, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to throw something at you right off the bat because I'm such a big fan of One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. It, it's, you know, without a doubt in my top ten of all time, and I, I just absolutely, absolutely adore Milos Foreman. Uh, you know, you, you were part of the ensemble uh, of that beautiful, beautiful adaptation of uh, Ken Kesey's novel. Uh, I know that Milos, uh, from what I understood, he kind of would have all of, you know, the actors kind of stay in, in their own like little rooms in the, in the hospital ward. And I know that you were, you know, your character, I believe, was like chained to a wall. Now, did he did you have to remain chained to the wall or did you did he actually give you a room to go back to? Well, actually, um, <laughs> my character was Ellis, Ellis. And in, in the original uh, Ken Kesey novel. Ellis was the, uh, the rabble rouser, just like McMurphy was. As a matter of fact, he had a Christ complex, so his arms are out. He pretends that he's uh, crucified to the wall. Was not chained. You weren't However, chained. I always thought that, was, that he was the, yeah, wow, all right. And then uh, in the film... There's a couple times where I asked, uh, it was Alonzo Brown, who was the uh, African-American heavyset orderly, mm-hmm. when he, he came up to take me to the day room, where he actually uh, pretended to pull the nails out of my, uh, out of my hands. Oh, wow. Um, and so it was uh, um, true to the original story. You want to- mm. uh, sure. Sure. Uh, Milos actually, uh, oh, there I am. Oh, my God. That's me. <laughs> uh, hey. <laughs> I, I have my first, uh, my second Skype at, attempt. It's kind of cool. Anyway, um, yes, Milos has a uh, very specific approach to doing his, his art. Right. What I found out was that when, when we arrived in Salem, Oregon, we were at the real hospital. The doctor, Spidey, was the real doctor at the hospital. Um, We had two weeks of rehearsals with camera for major scenes for blocking. We also had to spend about two hours a day on different wards with real patients. We were actually locked in, uh, not locked, but doors closed with an orderly looking through the window in the door for the, uh, it was, uh, I think, the third floor. It was for the uh, criminally insane. Uh, today's protocol would be uh, the antisocial ones. But um, we were allowed uh, the experience of understanding what really took place at a real functioning state and, hospital. And that's amazing. I mean, because this, this basically was your first project uh, as an actor. And what I wanted to ask you is, how does the son of a neurosurgeon who was working as a florist uh, get a role in Cuckoo's Nest and then, and then the hills have eyes and become one of the most legendary horror actors uh, over the past 30 years? Well, actually, I, 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 was, uh, I delivered flowers uh, when I was in high school. But as far as when I was discovered by George Powell, the original producer of The War of the Worlds, was actually I was not a florist. What was going on is that in Venice Beach, I grew up in Santa Monica, which is called Dogtown. It's surfing. It's California, West Coast. And in Venice Beach, after college, I came back and I started a little gift shop. It was kind of a hippy dippy arts, all kinds of artisans, and we we had house plants. That's where the florist thing comes in, which is actually uh, incorrect. So we had 
local artists that would put their wares in our store and we would take a slight commission if, if we could sell them. Across the street was a very high-end antique store called the Gallimaufry. It was owned by the uh, son and daughter-in-law of George Powell. So one night there was a fancy event with Bentleys and chauffeurs and Rolls Royces and we decided to bring in <coughs> excuse me, some of our larger plants just to make the place look nice, like some palms and things like that. So we were kind of hanging out, waiting for the event to close. It was a very high-end auction, you know, Ming Dynasty, egg urns, that kind of stuff, antiques. So when they closed uh, for the evening, we took all our stuff back across the street. During that evening, a very astute gentleman walked up to me and introduced himself, and he says, I would like to put you in my movie. You have an interesting face. And I said, well, who are you? And he said, I'm George Powell, and this is my son and daughter-in-law. And I knew who he was because I went to grammar school with Paris Hilton's uncle and father, Red Skelton. His son, Richard, was in my grammar school class. I used to go to the house and read comic books, and Red Skelton would come up to the, to the bedroom and, and become a, a kid with Richard. Um, the Lawfords went there, et cetera, et cetera. So I knew who George Powell was because I loved movies way back since I was a child. So I said, well, do you know who you are? And he smiled and he says, who am I? And I go, you produced War of the Worlds, the original. And mm. yes, you have a, a, an interesting um, face and I'd like you to be in Doc Savage and play the coroner who brings the uh, test results for the death of Doc Savage. And I said, oh, you mean those cool books? And he goes, yes. And he said, would you please be in my movie? And I said, well, I'm not an actor. I have a degree in art history, but I want to homestead in Alaska and do nature uh, conservatory. In other words, the areas that are still unspoiled, I always wanted to be able to keep them unspoiled for future generations. And he said, well, before you leave, could you do my movie? I'll do Screen Actors Guild card. And we had friends that were worked for Walt Disney uh, as, day play, as, as contract players, etc. So I said, sure. So I worked two days, had a union card, and I figured, there's my career. It's over and done with. <laughs> George had a casting director that was casting for another movie, and that was Cuckoo's Nest. That was Mike Fenton and Gene Feinberg. They called me and said, we got your number from George. Would you please come down to Culver Studios and meet Michael Douglas, Joel Douglas, Salt Vance, Milos Foreman, and we're going to uh, talk about you playing a lobotomy patient since you've had a uh, craniac and your father's a, a world-renowned neurologist. Maybe it would be a good fit. Well, wow. my question was, of course, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, you we get a chance to work with Milos for Foreman, right. I and mean, that doesn't come along. Right. Either. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, Mummy, uh, what do you have for Michael? Oh, I mean, I have a whole bunch of things, but I, you know what? What strikes me most and what, what I find fascinating is, you know, how intelligent and how articulate you are. And I just wonder if people are surprised when they meet you based on the roles that you play. Do they have preconceived notions and do they find the incongruity, uh, you know, startling or shocking? Or I bet you're meeting a lot of people at, hor at horror conventions who probably know. Or ha how's your experience meeting people in there and what their reactions are to you? Well, I got to tell you, I really appreciate an insightful question as you just um Posed. And uh, the answer, of course, is over the many decades, people, I have been interviewed a lot. I, I, I speak, I do panels. Um, people know that um, I'm an arty guy, and yes, I have a broad brush when it comes to topics. So, no, I'm not. Um, I'm, I'm very pleased with the conversations I have with my fans. I actually... Um, I, I answer all my fan uh, mail myself, and wow. mm. yeah, I, I made it. I, I made it a promise to myself. I figured if someone's, it's like the Simpsons episode where Ringo Starr is going through the mail, and it takes some years to get. No. <laughs> yeah, I kind of feel like Ringo in a sense. If someone, if a fan took enough effort and time, 
uh, I should be able to do this. You know, you do a lot. You do a lot of interaction with your with your fans, and what I'm struck w- w- by the horror fans, and this this goes again to preconceived notions, is that you know a lot of people on the outside of the horror community might think that they're you know uh, weird or vulgar or strange, but when you go to these conventions, I find that a lot of them are really friendly and have, look just looking to have fun, yeah. and they have a lot of respect. And do do you is that is that your experience as well when you when you're attending these conventions? 99% of the time, absolutely correct. Most of these people are uh, police officers, mm-hmm. teachers, firemen, people that are not, I, I guess they're part of the 47%, the ones that we need more dearly. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. right. It's a no-brainer. We're, I love we're, it. <laughs> we, we are at critical mass, so... Um, uh, what they want you to do more than anything else is is to embrace despair and not vote. So enough said there. Please right. vote. Mm-hmm. But yes, I um, I always wanted to make a living as an artist. And of course, every art instructor I ever had said you need a PhD so you can be a professor. And there's always uh, you know young uh, freshmen and sophomore beautiful girls that just think you're their daddy, you know, so to speak. Uh, there were a few like that, but I, uh, and I says, you're a lucky dog you are. But on the more, uh, um, on a higher note, I would just say that I, I took what they said to heart, and, and I realized that very few artists actually get to make a living doing what they love. That's mm. true. Thanks to George Powell, and I kept my promise. He said, if anybody ever asks you, tell them that I discovered you. But the reason I was discovered is because... I was in the right place at the right time. The only reason I was in Venice Beach at the time, and George happened to be there that one evening, and only that one evening, is because about six months prior, I had helped a friend rebuild a house in Washington State that had burned to the ground. While his neighbors were on vacation, he had a, a roof over his head. The insurance money uh, from the insurance company was just enough to cover materials and do the rough plumbing. So he didn't have anybody to, you know, cut a board or hammer a nail. So a friend of mine, who we also went to grammar school with, who is now a Berkeley professor of economics, actually graduated from the same class as Robert Wright, who I believe was the uh, economic advisor for the Clinton administration. <laughs> Long story short, uh, I stuck my thumb out on the Pacific Coast Highway at Venice Beach, got a ride from some hippies in a van. It was lovely. We made it all the way to Berkeley. And then my buddy and I drove up to Washington State, and in seven weeks, we were putting the, the, the ridge caps on the roof. And mm-hmm. when I came back to uh, um, California, I, I went into the little gift shop with a friend of mine, and that's how I met George. So my mm-hmm. point is serendipity really is important. What you put out comes back to you. So right. if you're stingy, um, you're going to wind up. You know, at the end of your days, kind of, you know, kind of bitter with a big bank account. And what good is that? That's not, right. not that's nothing good about that, Michael. The <laughs> 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 dies most toys on the BMW uh, bumper. That's that to live your life. Michael, what would you find most uh, more frightening? One of the characters that you play in your films or Mitt Romney yeah. being elected for the next president of the United States? <laughs> well, more Mitt... fright- the, bike, the bike gang and weird science or, or the possible Romney administration? What's more frightening? Well, it, it's a no-brainer. The Romney administration, as anyone who is educated knows, is, is a puppet and the strings go all the way to the uh, – um, the apocalyptic, we have to have World War Three. Jesus being king of the world for a thousand years. Right. They're insane. Yes. They're in- it's funny because we just, we just, they're, glo- they're yeah. globalists. They don't care about yeah. this country one bit. And that's the truth because I've met them and I've talked to them. I won't mention names. I like breathing. <laughs> <laughs> hey, da- David, what do you, what do you have for uh, Mr. Berryman? Well, you, you know, Michael, first of all, I just want to say it's, it's really great to get a chance to talk to you. Uh, I, big admirer of your work um well, thank you you know that, I, means, that tells me you're an artistic intelligent person <laughs> i try I do my best. dave's dave's with fangoria magazine oh shout out to my buddies there yeah you bet <laughs> well yeah you're quite familiar and you and, and you know what we all love you um you know i want to maybe ask a bit of a of a personal thing here and sure. and there's you know 
especially here in here in Canada, but but all over the world recently, there's been a lot of talk about bullying. Um, we had a young lady up here in uh, in Vancouver, British Columbia. Uh, she took her own life recently. Really awful story about how she was she was bullied into it. Yep. And I, I understand you were subjected to some bullying when you were growing up. What do you have to say to people out there who are who are different and who are standing out a bit and having to put up with some of this stuff? Um, I, I, I do a lot of mentoring. I, I, I got invited via Paul Newman to be part of the Bogey Creek Gang, which is in Orlando, Florida. And they rebuild children's spaces, take care of the entire family during the process, have someone stay at their home while they're away. It's the uh, Florida Cranial Facial Society out of the University of, of Orlando. <clears throat> My father, being a, a neurologist, took me to Children's Hospital one Saturday morning. I had my first and only haircut. Um, woke up blind. I could see eventually. They basically um, cut, you know, cut into my skull so it would spread apart. So my massive brain would have an accommodating apartment. But to answer your question specifically, I tell kids because I've done a lot of a, a lot of school districts. And with mentoring with someone who has a difference, number one, turn your hobbies into, into your ally. In other words, if you can turn your hobbies, things that you love and that you're passionate about, especially if they're positive, if you can turn that into a lifestyle and a career, that's wonderful. Also know this, um, I used to get more upset with the parents than the bullies when I was young for the following reason. The parents would let it happen. They wouldn't stop their child. These days when you got these, depending on your zip code, um, out here in, uh, uh, in, in, in urban uh, cities, you know, you have the uh, super moms, the soccer moms. I, I see a lot of neurotic behavior in, in society where there are industrialized uh, uh, communities and we think that we're really doing a great job because we have all the bells and whistles. When, when you... Forsake your humanity, and what goes around comes around. You know, there before the grace of God go I. And all of those things really matter. So I would tell the parents, number one, let the children know that you, you don't say to a kid who has a physical difference like myself, for instance, I'm an exception, that you're going to be a movie star. That's not the healthiest approach. Mm -hmm. The healthiest approach is, number one, uh, get the medical attention that they need, Mr. Romney. You know, people have, to, I know people who have lost their homes. I know fathers who have divorced and, and who have abandoned their families so they could get on assistance because we don't take care of our own in this country anymore. All right. And they want to end it. So get the medical help that you need, number one. Number two, <clears throat> let them know that they're unconditionally loved. Number three, find out what their strengths are. You know, if it's, uh, if they can't, matriculate math or figure things out in their head, then they're going to need someone to look over them after, you, after you're gone. For the parents, I'm saying this. For the children, just know that it's usually misinformed. However, don't give them the, the, the blank check to say, oh, well, I'm going to turn the other cheek, or they, oh, they don't understand. No. Bullying and mean behavior is taught behavior. Mm-hmm. And well, it's not the kid. It's not the kids who are at fault there. They do mean what they say that hurts, and it does cause death. People need to know that that is not acceptable. Hmm. We're talking with uh, oh. uh, Mike, actor Michael Berryman, right now. Uh, hey, Michael, one of uh, one of your biggest fans uh, is a co-host on the show. His name is uh, Max. Max, he's all yours, brother. Hey, Max, what's up, buddy? Michael, I just want you to know that I'm sitting here looking at your extraordinary visage, and I'm discovering this remarkable brain, which I kind of already knew was behind the visage. Are you Thank getting you. a visual from my... Uh, oh, yeah. I think oh. I need to set a scene here. Okay. We are watching this man talk to us. We are looking at his face. He's drinking a Japanese beer, Sapporo. He's relaxed. He's pleasant. He's enjoying himself, it appears. I, I have to say I, I'm truly... <laughs> He's wiggling his ears right now. <laughs> I just want to say, Michael, that if I could, I would take my tongue and lick your entire pate. No, Jesus no, uh, Christ. Uh, no, you wouldn't. Would, uh... <laughs> <laughs> now, listen. Truth be told, I, I, 
I cannot pronounce uh, properly this. Um, this. W- what have you been born with? It's three words. Okay, it's um, hydrocratic ectodermal dysplasia. Right. Now, and it says that you cannot uh, sweat, correct? I do not perspire, that's correct. Okay, it says you don't grow hair. Oh, actually, I, I shave. Um, I actually had a nice head of hair until they uh, um, did the craniectomy uh, because of the blood loss when they literally uh, cut, uh, you know, well, it's hard to see, but you can see where they cut here and here mm-hmm. and here. And they spread it apart and they took pieces of bone from my pelvis and used them as spacers. They only had one shot at it. This was Children's Hospital. They saved my life. My dad was a brain surgeon. He couldn't do the operation, but he he over, uh, oversaw the uh, the art that these wonderful physicians do. As a matter of fact, anytime I had a report card that was subpar, my dad would say, "Hey, come here. You can get a better grade here in this or that subject. You have a good brain. I've seen it." <laughs> so that was kind of the grounding approach. I was very blessed to have my father in in that mode. Uh, my mom was a little more emotional. She was a nurse. Uh, my great aunt was a nurse. Um, spent a lot of time with my uh, my nana, my grandmother, taught me to cook. Very grounding. I had some good upbringing in that regard. Um, but the condition leaves, uh, it manifests in different ways. Basically, from my upper upper jaw to the sinus areas by my eyes, this whole area is underdeveloped. I had to have my nose uh, all broken and cleaned up, and they went in through my cheeks and put a little lift under my eye because it was drooping. Unfortunately, this one <laughs> went up the size of a baseball, and I had to uh, fly all the way from our, our Kansas, where we were living, to Beverly Hills and have them go up there and rip that out. That was delightful. Um, so there's medical issues you deal with. You know, you can be beautiful and have fantastic hair like Mr. Romney today, slip on a bad <laughs> soap, and be a retard tomorrow. Mm. Well, it's a testament to your parents, man, that you <laughs> that, that that they they raised you and you are such a positive force. You're, you, I mean, yeah. everything. I, I do have a uh, as a kid. I used to have. I I can have a very fiery temper. Uh, especially when it deals with in, injustice. I, I don't dig that at all, and I'm not the person that would be sitting on the side of the road while someone's in, in crisis. I jump right in. I used to have an advanced first aid um, instructor's uh, certificate, and I've been a first responder on many occasions. And people, we're all on this you know, class nine planet together. We, we have to figure it out. It's not it's not rocket science that we need more of. We need more compassion, more humanity, more understanding. That that. Um, yeah, absolutely. Hey, Monsanto, how come you have? And then people who are in science, uh, scientists who design this uh, this pollen from a Monsanto seed. When it blows to another place, it it alters the plant that it touches. Uh, I don't think that's quite very cool. Oh, and also, by the way, they own it. So uh, I'm a I'm a student of history. I, uh, genocide comes in many shapes and, co- and colors, and um, these days we have our children have a very enormous thing to deal with. They want to pass a law saying that they don't have to t- come clean and tell us what's in the meat in the pink slime. I used to be a meat cutter in college. <laughs> uh, I was a wholesale butcher. I used to read the trades. Uh, I've been an assistant chef. I've worked in food and beverage off and on for most of my life. Um, so why can't we just have real food? Well, folks, the only way to do that is to get some dirt, love it, take care of it, protect it, and then you have good dirt, you know? Fellas, Michael Berryman is a beautiful hippie. Are you ready for this? Yeah, basically. <laughs> now, now, Michael, I know you also don't have fingernails and you don't sweat. You are not missing anything. You're not missing anything. I sweat a lot. I hate it. Fingernails are a big pain in the ass. Well, so that's, you're that's free. Do come in handy, you know. <laughs> oh, he just tried to pick his nose with no fingernails. Uh, it, it, it was now, paw picking. Now let me. He he didn't really pick his nose, folks. Now let me ask you, Michael. Let's get back to the acting for a second. Sure. I'm going to ask a very shallow question. Okay. Do you embrace being a horror icon, or is it a giant pain in the ass for you sometimes? Hmm. Do you want to do Shakespeare? Do you want to do Beckett? Are you a theater oh. man? 
Uh, actually, I, I've never done a lot of theater. I did study Shakespeare. Beckett's one of my favorite plays. I, I loved uh, my favorite performance of Beckett was, of course, uh, um, Mr. Burton or Sir Burton. Richard Burton married Elizabeth Taylor. Um, I realized, and I was in a uh, like a Simon and Garfunkel duo with a friend of mine from high school. Played a wonderful Martin guitar. Uh, I can sing pretty well. I, I, I'm a bit of a poet. I do still photography. I can write very. I, I'm a very good writer. I wrote lyrics for some songs, and we played around L.A. area just for fun. But being a horror icon is a good thing, I, and, and I'm very grateful to Peter Locke and Wes Craven for putting me on the cover of The Hills Have Eyes. They were going to go with Papa Juke, but um, there were some issues, and during the filming of Hills Have Eyes, which was, you know, drive out of the studio zone north of L.A., go out to the desert. We don't need right. to permit. Let's just, here's the desert. Let's shoot it. Well, it was rough and tumble, and during that time, I was having surgery under my arm, so, uh, I mean... There's a few times if you look really close, you'll see a little swatch of white. That's from the, uh, you know, the dressings. But Peter uh, called into his office one day and he said, you know, you're such a trooper. You weren't complaining. It was hot in the daytime. You can't you dissipate heat very well. At night, it was cold. I love that. And he said, you know, I want to give you a million dollars worth of advertising. In other words, I'm going to put you on the cover of all the artwork for the film. But that helped my career tremendously. As far as the mm -hmm. roles that I play... I always, I'll make them real to the best of my ability, but I don't do things just for gratuitous uh, slash gore. It has to be mm. some kind of a story. And I think The Hills Have Eyes, if you really look at the film, it's perfect. I used to think the, well, I took a tire iron and I split his face wide open. It takes place at Grandpa Fred's gas station. Mm -hmm. and, I, and then the guy goes, well, how bad was it? It used to make me laugh, but I realized later that Wes Craven put that in there. Ha ha, that's funny. How bad was it? He split his face wide open. And then the guy looks down on the floor and he goes, well, what's all this stuff? Oh, nothing. And then boom, through the window, out you go. So he crafts his art very well. So I'd like to have my characters that I play. And I played everything from a villain to an angel. And in between, uh, smoke in the boys' room with, with the crew. Yeah, oh, that's, that's awesome. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, with, the, with the wacky wig. And <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I do it all. And uh, I like very much to always learn. You know, every time I do something, I, I want to be a little better at it. I did a great film with Eddie Furlong two years ago in Canada called Below Zero. We filmed it in uh, Gas town called Edson, E-D-S-O-N. The whole town came out and, and supported us. It's like a Hitchcock thriller. It just came out on Netflix. Beats. Oh, great. It's excellent. I've been waiting for that one. Oh, it's now, really great. That's awesome. I just lost my train of thought because I can't take my well, eyes off. Well, as a, as, a, as a horror icon, Michael, I mean, you're, you're, tr you're turning it into something again. You're just you're turning something that is a little bit gruesome into something very positive and beautiful. I well, mean, you're using, your, you're using your status as, you know, your popularity and your celebrity to get on here and just what you were doing here. And you're, you're spreading your, your message and you're, you're doing good work with it. And, I mean, you. You, it's just it's great to see. Well, uh, I'm um, just, and, and so and, and so do you right back at you. I mean, we um, I was on the last Morton Downey Jr. Uh, show. Awesome. And there are some people in the audience. Wow, that, you, you are a fan of the absurd. Yeah, they, they were, yeah did, exactly. he, did he blow? Did he blow smoke in your face? No, I. I, I uh, uh, well, verbally he tried, but um, we were in the green room, and he you know, he wanted some contentious behavior, so that happened. But there was a lady that was shouting us down, saying that what we did was terrible. And then I said, "Well, listen, uh, what you have to realize is number one, uh, true horror." Is sending uh, 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 kids off to die in a war. Yeah, yeah. That that's real war. Uh, the genocide that takes place on all the continents. That's that that's horror. Um, someone points a finger at a woman and says, "Oh, she means she." Uh, I got a stiffy while I had a dream. It's you know, let's 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 stone her to death. I mean, this is all insane. Mm -hmm. This is insanity. Uh, yeah. Go back to yeah, go back to altar boys. Insanity. Uh, Right. Uh, well, well, I mean, you know, you, you, you start repressing. You know, what is horror? Horror is horrific. What we do is scare you. What we do is allow you an opportunity 
as horror actors, for instance, for that genre, we allow you to get into a situation where, oh my gosh, what would I do in this situation? And then at the end of the, uh, of the film, you're out walking to your car. You have survived a, a, a troubling situation. And maybe during the process of those 120 minutes, maybe you weren't thinking about, can I pay them more? Maybe you weren't thinking about, oh, uh, you know, uh, someone's ill. So we give you a little bit of respite. We give you a little bit of, ah, and An you feel good. Bad guys get their come up and right. but there and telling, is and telling and telling people telling people what they should or should not be doing artistically that's horror. That's uh, <laughs> that, yeah, that's brutally horrific. I mean, how dare you? Yeah, how dare exactly. you? Looks, uh, uh, brilliant people used to say, you know what? I don't think the world. Uh, I know the world's not flat, and uh, that was uh, you could be killed for saying something like that. Well, that's mm -hmm. horrible. That's horrible. So what we do is more terror, thrilling. We tell stories. It's one of the oldest art forms on the planet. And, That's and all good and fine and beautiful. But, Michael, don't you love, don't you get a catharsis out of killing people? Come on, man. Even though it's not really happening, it's got to be cathartic somewhat. <laughs> well, um, when I have to dispatch someone in a, <laughs> in a gruesome manner, I actually have a short list. If I had superpowers for 48 hours, I would be a very busy fellow. <laughs> I, I suspect that the country would be a much better place the world as well. Would be a very much better place. I would get a hold of my good friend Robert Downey Jr. and I said, "Let's put on the suits and we're blasting off here because uh, we got we got a list of people." I'll give him a chance for redemption. You know, like Superman. You know, okay, we'll throw him in outer space or put him in the. Well, we know where they need to go. Yeah. Maybe that's where the pink slime. Uh, my <laughs> My, Michael, you you know you've worked with Milos Forman. You you've had a a great working relationship with uh, Wes Craven in the past. Now uh, Rob Zombie seems to to be someone that that just, uh, adores your talents. Uh, tell us about uh, what to expect from from the Lords of Salem. Boy, I knew you were going to ask me that. I had just had that conversation with uh, my good friend Sid Haig over the weekend at a uh, convention. And uh, to be quite honest, we're sworn to secrecy, number one. Number two, Richard Lynch uh, passed away this year, so we did not get to finish the scenes in the opening sequence of Lords of Salem um, with Richard Lynch. Um, Sid Haig and I are the Magnus brothers. We're butchers, and we're going to help dis dispatch and take care of some witches. Um, there's an opening sequence that we did film that was epic. I mean, I mean, it was just, it looked pitching, man. I mean, uh, you know, a chair with spikes and witches and and smoke and you can imagine. I mean, but I don't even know if that will be in the film. It's all top secret. Mm -hmm. And at the very end, the scenes that I shot may be put back in, or maybe they won't. I, I really don't know. But I will tell you this, when we did Devil's Rejects, I was impressed with, uh, with uh, Mr. Zombie. Uh, Rob is very uh, professional. Um, I asked him how he got those skills, and he said, well, you know, I have a band, we go on tour, and I have to be uh, the, a grown-up on occasion. So, uh, I mean, if you're married to Sh Sherry, Sherry Moon, uh, you don't need to go out uh, <laughs> church baby, right? You know, yeah. these guys that I know would be very uh, fine for that. So uh, Rob is very organized. We don't have to go into overtime. He says he makes sure that when they're on doing their tour, that all the equipment will be there, and he double checks and makes phone calls. So he's a go-to kind of guy. He's a hands-on uh, uh, producer, director. Now, when we were doing the chicken scene. That hillbilly comedian was just having too much fun, and Rob just gave him free reign. So, yes, when Cleavon was saying certain things about the guy to Ken Forey, uh, Cleavon uh, was really, really ticked off. Yeah, so that was real anger because uh, when we had a, had our cut, I walked up to the gentleman. I go, "What do you do for a living?" He goes, "I'm a stand-up comedian." I said, "Well, keep your day job because if you keep behaving in this manner." You're not going to be welcome on a set when you have scripted scenes. So, <laughs> but yeah, I can I can play it hard and rough and tumble if I have to. Wow, I mean, Zombie's just amazing. I mean, to put Michael Berryman and and uh, Sid Haig and and Ken Forey uh, all together, cool. I mean, that's just crazy. Well, he's we would, the wisest director of casting there is. Seriously. Yeah, I mean, exactly. 
we would have to add uh, Kane Hodder for backup because you don't mess with Kane Hodder. <laughs> Is there a secret room where all of you go and yes. and and drink and just tell stories and cut loose together? Where is that room? It, well, if my uh, friend is an air traffic controller. When I used to ask him about Area 51 and the aliens, he'd say, if I told you, I'd have to kill you. So, <laughs> uh, I, I want to make sure you're taken care of as you, as you ascend into old age. I want to make sure you're all right. How's your SAG hey, pension? Um, my, I'm, I'm, well, I'm actually receiving my pension. Um, one of the biggest troubling aspects uh, in our industry was the combination of AFTRA and SAG. I thought it was a weakening of our contracts, number one. Number two, a lot of runaway production has happened, but now there's either the big name stars you know, getting $10, $20 million a pop plus all the back end money, and then everybody else, uh, they're, uh, honestly, for all you aspiring actors, realize this, uh, they want everybody to, uh, to work for 100 bucks a day you know, uh, and, and have, have zero go into your pension and, 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 and uh, health insurance which is really a, a bummer. And also, you don't get any residuals. So if you're episodic or movie of the week, especially if you're episodic on television, you're going to be fine. If you get a nice feature and you get a starring role, you're going to be fine. But they're really trying to uh, whittle down the contracts to just, you know, uh, everybody's getting this and that's all you're getting. But I have a really excellent manager and uh, we can make things happen for our benefit. Uh, my heart does go out to a lot of our struggling brothers and sisters in the field, and that includes from stunts to um, Yahtzee and everybody else. I am a union guy. I always have been. Um, union, unions came about for a reason. Uh, study your labor law history. Uh, George Meany, that's a good person to look up. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's important to be safe. Uh, when somebody, uh, some famous actress was saying that she didn't know that her uh, sporting line was being... Um, produced by children <laughs> on floating barges off the coast because international labor laws for children don't apply on water. How can... Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Michael, Michael, it was, it, was, it, was, it was a real treat having you uh, on the cutting room tonight. No! no! I know, we, we, gotta, we gotta let Why? Michael go because he's a busy guy. Right, he's he's sitting there drinking can... beer. <laughs> Michael, tell us what your first... Tell us the the the, the uh, theme of the show tonight is the first movie that scared us as we were kids oh. when we were kids. You have one off you have one off the top of your mind. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. It was uh, the Wolf Man when he when the when the moonlight came in onto the bed and he started that transformation. Uh, that did it for me. And when he uh, broke out, and went running through. I'm going oh, okay. Uh, so, so I'm loving this stuff. You know, oh, it was uh, Wolf Man. Lon Chaney. Yep. So you I can please, you, you guys please but, your uh, memoirs. Can you hear me? Can do this. What's he doing? Oh, look at him. He's wiggling his ears again. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, you ear wiggling <laughs> master of horror. Will you look at one at a time? He's wiggling. Will you write your damn book already. What are you waiting for? You're sitting around there with that wife of yours drinking beer. Why don't you write a, a, your memoirs? <laughs> Uh, well, uh, I think everybody that uh, uh, that would be uh, displeased with what I had to say uh, are are passed on now. So I have a green light. <laughs> green light, baby. There you go. No, I do plan yeah. on writing. Uh, I do plan on writing it this winter, and I was thinking of making it a three part. Number one, retrospect to my career. Uh, number two, uh, what it was like growing up being me. And number three, my favorite recipes because I'm a foodie. So <laughs> you I love that. You love that cooking, and, huh, Michael? He's a culinary artist to he boot. Loves, How about he that? loves it. He's a culinary artist. Bon Michael, thank you so much for coming on tonight and talking to us and, and uh, giving our, our listeners, our fans, a chance to, to hear a little bit about, about who you are. And, and I got to tell you right now, I mean, it, it, was, uh, it, it was an amazing experience. That, thanks a lot, Michael, for coming on tonight. And, and happy right. Halloween. And, and we, we really look forward to seeing you in Rob Zombie's The Lords of Salem and, and everything else that you have coming up, man. I, I, it's it's going to be amazing. And any cause, any causes or links or websites that you want to send our fans to charities, anything like that. It sounds like you're an activist. So anything you have, um, send it over to us, and we'll we'll post it with our show. Oh, absolutely, I certainly will. And uh, remember, uh, we're in this together. Take care of one another. You got it. Thank you, Michael. Bye, Peace Michael. out. Thanks, all right, man. All right, that was Michael Berryman, man, and that was that was.